Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining our Thursday lectures uh, with the Education USA in Ukraine. And I hope you're all doing fine this uh, frosty uh, winter day. And I'm very pleased to introduce uh, our today's speaker, Alena Savitska. Uh, the uh, regional manager at Minerva School at KGI and Alona is actually uh, will share her tips uh, today with you on how to uh, impress the admission commission because now we know that we're still in the midst of the period when many of you submitting their documents to universities and um, you might be asking yourself how you can do better to show all your best sides and all your strong qualities and skills. So Alona is the is the one who um, who can share the information from inside of the university because she knows a little bit better um, what the admission commission is waiting from the uh, students when they're reading the uh, resumes and reading the um, uh, recommendation letters. And um, uh, as usual, at the end of the uh, presentation, we will have time for your questions. So please uh, feel free to ask any question about the um, about the subject of what we are going to talk about today uh, to Alona, and Alona will um, will answer all of your questions. And Alona, uh, please, uh, you can. The floor is yours, and uh, our students are really waiting for the for the information from you. Maybe some of them uh, have like last minute uh, preparation ready to, and some documents are ready to be submitted and your tips and um, your advices will uh, help them to improve their um, uh, admission uh, package. Thank you very much, Katya. Hi, everyone. Yes, my name is Alona. I am a regional manager for Eastern Europe and Central Asia at Minerva Schools at KGI. Being the um, People that are uh, sort of like a part of the Education USA community, you probably have heard some things about our university. Uh, and I'm very excited to be holding this session specifically because I feel like it's a very good opportunity for people who are not just interested in Minerva, but are really looking to just reflect on their accomplishments, reflect on uh, the things that they're proud of, and really think about the details that can be relevant and important in sharing with the admissions committee. In terms of the structure of uh, today's session, we have, um, I'm guessing like 15 minutes, that uh, we'll be focusing on Minerva structure specifically. And while I go through some of the uh, some of the aspects of the Minerva experience, you will understand why I'm going through them just to give you a little bit of a context of who we are and what we do. And then after that, the majority of our um, session presentation is going to be focused on uh, the accomplishments and uh, sort of like the way to portray them. Uh, I will have a number of cases. And even though we cannot talk directly to each other, what I highly suggest you do is uh, make notes to yourself, but also be engaged as if we actually were talking to each other and as if I actually was asking you all of those questions. So try to reflect and try to sort of like measure that against yourself as we go through some of the slides and some of the information. So yeah, uh, a couple of things about myself. Uh, as I said, my name is Alona. I come from Kazakhstan originally. I did not graduate from Minerva, but I have lived in seven different countries. So uh, my experience is uh, somewhat similar to what Minerva students have been experiencing, but through a very, very different um, approach. Uh, in terms of uh, sort of like following through with today's session, um, the lucky person that I am, I did not manage to upload the presentation by myself. So Katya is going to be helping me. And throughout this presentation, you will hear a lot of me asking Katya to change one slide into another. Uh, so it's definitely going to be a little laugh inside of my head. I hope it's going to be a little laugh inside of your head as well. So uh, Katya, could we please go into the next slide? Um, and as I said earlier, we will be talking a little bit more about Minerva, right? So uh, we're a brand new university. We have uh, built an institution that um, is very innovative and in a lot of ways just completely disrupted the higher education system. We uh, took a look at everything that we thought was wrong in the education system in in the world up till now, and uh, we decided to change a number of things. And Katya, if, if we can go to the next slide, I'm going to share a little bit more about some of the key aspects of what Minerva is. 
And I think the first and the key uh, component of the Minerva experience is its curriculum. And uh, the way that it's different is that the things that you would learn in one class would be referenced in another and then in year two and in year three. So instead of uh, studying separate disciplines where you would go to, I don't know, biology class, uh, memorize a bunch of content, um, pass a test and then go into a chemistry class, do the same thing, pass a test and then into physics, you would actually be learning and understanding systems. And think of it that way. At Minerva, we don't ask you what it is that you would want to learn. We're asking you what problems and issues you would want to solve. And that's a very, very different approach. We want our students to have the cognitive skills and tools to actually be able to understand the system, understand the issues, and then go and actually solve them. So Minerva degree is very practical, but it's also very multidisciplinary. And you would always be sort of like understanding the structure. Uh, another very significant thing about the Minerva experience is the fact that we do not believe in tests and we do not believe in lectures. We don't have any of those. Uh, you will never be sitting at a Minerva lecture. That thing just doesn't exist. Instead, what we'll have is a flipped classroom format. All of our students, they're reading the material first, then they're doing their homework. And a lot of that homework actually implies and requires for them to go outside into the city and do something in the city, do the research in the city. And only after that, they would be able to come into the class and learn to work with that material. So it's a very... Um, it's a much deeper interaction with uh, what the students have been learning. And uh, again, a very different approach. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, Katya, please. See? Mental smile inside of my head. So uh, talking about the majors and the concentrations, we have five majors at Minerva. Uh, there's arts and humanities, there's computational sciences, there's social sciences and uh, natural sciences, social sciences and business. And uh, Inside of each concentration, uh, inside of each major, there's a number of concentrations, namely six. And as you can see on the slide, all of those concentrations are, again, not just one thing. And if you are interested in, for example, psychology, you wouldn't just be studying psychology. You would be studying mind and emotion, and you would be looking at how uh, our brains function. What are the biochemical reactions that are happening? Uh, what, how is that reflected on the emotions? How all of that is covered by the psychological theories and how to make use of that. And throughout your research project, you would actually need to focus on this one area and this one issue, this one um, problem that you would want to solve. And um, in terms of, I think, like one of the most exciting ones that uh, at least in the COVID times is something that uh, I see more and more students are getting interested in is something like designing solutions, which is under natural sciences, but at the same time, it looks at the problems in the medical field in the 21st century and ways to solve them. So again, Minerva education is not just about you studying one thing or you focusing on one uh, discipline, but it's actually a very holistic uh, approach to a specific issue and a specific problem. If we can go to the next slide. And I think this is one of the most glamorous slides about uh, the Minerva experience. This is something we're mega famous for, is the fact that our students don't live in just one place. We are a U.S. university. Our uh, headquarters is based in San Francisco. However, as an institution, we have built a program for our students where throughout the four years of their studies, they actually live in seven different places. They start in San Francisco and they spend their first semester there with all of their classmates and everything. And then after that, together with their class, they start traveling the world. They go to all of those different places. They go to Taipei, they go to Seoul, they go to Hyderabad, Berlin, Buenos Aires, uh, and London, and then they come back to San Francisco. And um, we believe that it's an essential part of the of the university process, of the studies process for our students. So being a part of Minerva, you actually do get to live in all of those seven different places. When it comes to COVID, uh, we have been uh, very flexible to the students. So uh, if the students need to stay at home, for example, that's also an option. If we can go to the next slide. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, we do not believe in tests which is why, frankly speaking, we don't even care that much about your TOEFL, your SATs, your IELTS, your ACTs, and any other standardized testing. We simply do not care. Um, 
Instead, we're focusing on our own development, on our own admissions process that has three unique parts to it. So the first part is uh, who you are, which is basically the the basic information about yourself. So that's your grades, that's your academic history, that's your school, your the, school, the rating of your school, and um, uh, your counselor and your contact information and things like that. In the second part, which is a substitution to the standardized testing, because don't get us wrong, we don't care about your standardized test, but we still want to see how you think. It's just that the things that we're um, sort of like checking and evaluating are how you think specifically without preparation. We want to see your raw thinking processes, which is why we have developed our own challenges that are nothing like the uh, standardized testing. Uh, and they're showing us how you can think specifically without preparation. And I mentioned that several times already, and it is important to remember, it is impossible to prepare for those tests. So you just need to go into, into the website and just do them. Uh, in the third part, we will want to see what you have achieved. So basically your accomplishments in your academic performance. And this is the part that we're going to be focusing on today, which is, again, applicable for a lot of universities, if not all. And I feel like we're at a really good place to have that conversation because as a university, we pay such a huge deal of attention specifically to that. We really want to see the things that you're proud of and how you talk about them, how you justify them. And um, yeah, I'm very excited for us to move into uh, the next part. Uh, in terms of this particular slide, I think what else is important uh, is the fact that we do not have any quotas. So even if we have 50 students from Ukraine or 20 students from your school, that is all going to be completely fine. Uh, Ukraine is actually one of the uh, the biggest countries for me, uh, you're always competing with Kazakhstan. It, it always goes Kazakhstan, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, Ukraine. And um, I'm very excited for that because in one year, I remember we had like 19 students from Ukraine and there were no quotas and there was nothing. So essentially, you're not competing against other people. You're competing against a specific bar. And uh, it's just a very different way to sort of like take a look at the students. In terms of the admissions calendar, we are accepting applications to uh, regular decision two, which is just as any cycle, it's open. And uh, we're going to be accepting applications until March 15th. So if you're still looking for a university, if you feel like Minerva can be, uh, a good option for you, definitely consider that um, that option. If we can move to the next slide. And yeah, financial aid is a big thing. Uh, I come from the region myself. I know and I understand what it feels like. Uh, and we all want to know what kind of financial aid opportunities are open to us. Uh, Minerva provides need-based financial aid and everyone is eligible to apply. We do not differentiate uh, whether that's a local student or uh, an international student. By the way, about 85% of our students are international students. So um, it's a very flipped uh, format. And uh, yeah, all students are eligible to apply for financial aid. Uh, and now, as I promised, it was a very, very part, a uh, very quick part talking about Minerva. Now we can actually start talking about the accomplishments. If we can move to the next slide, please. Perfect. So uh, talking about accomplishments, uh, and again, some of those things that I'm going to share with you are going to be um, Minerva specific. Some of those things and the majority of those things are actually going to be applied to um, the majority, if not all the universities, right? Uh, I think what's important to remember is that uh, there's what, like 4,500 uh, plus accredited institutions in the US. We all are accredited, we all have our autonomy, we all have our philosophies and approaches, and um, we all determine what it is that we're looking for, right? And um, the, the information that I'm going to be sharing with you is well, clearly going to be applicable to Minerva, but with other universities, it can be a good guideline, that's for sure, but I would definitely want for each and every one of us to still do our homework, to still do our research, to double check if that's what this particular university is looking for. So uh, I hope those are going to be uh, sort of like uh, useful tips but at the same time, keep in mind that you should always, always uh, research the university as well. And the first thing and the first tip 
that I would want to share with you, and if we can go to the next slide, that is going to be uh, always remembering the key lenses through which universities usually look at your accomplishments. And when we say accomplishments, that can be anything. That can be your sports, that can be your arts, that can be Olympiads, that can be your uh, professional projects, that can be work that you do because you're supporting your family. It can be anything, whatever it is that you're proud of. But whatever you put down in your application as, as an accomplishment, these are the three different, uh, the four different lenses through which we're going to be looking at those accomplishments. The first one is impact. Whatever it is that you do, uh, the admissions committee is always going to be looking for the impact of that activity that you did. I don't know, if that's um, a volunteer project, we will want to know how many dogs or um, orphans or bees you have uh, impacted with that particular project. If that is your... Um, I don't know, a professional project, again, maybe there is a social impact there. Uh, I remember we've had conversations with someone uh, during one of these sessions, uh, and the guy was like, well, I've been running a marathon. Uh, can I put that down as, um, like as an accomplishment example? Technically, uh, if you've been training to do something, and we're only looking at the impact right now, if you've been training to do something and you've excelled at it, that's great, and we will definitely want to know about that. But the additional details that can be helpful there is perhaps, besides just training for that particular marathon, maybe you have been uh, promoting that event, and maybe you brought... I don't know, like 500 different people that also were a part of that event. Maybe that event was a part of a bigger program that was part of the uh, fundraising. Uh, maybe uh, you have been, I don't know, supporting that organization team and actually did something more than just be a part of that event, right? So there can be so many different things that you could have been uh, doing with regards to that event. And it's important to mention and to remember that in any accomplishment that you're doing, we will want to see the impact. Even if you're doing, I don't know, like SAT prep courses and you've been working with, um, I don't know, 50 of your peers and their results got better, right? So don't forget to mention the results of the things that you're doing, the impact that you're bringing. Uh, the second thing that uh, is very, uh, that we're looking for uh, is commitment. Um, people do different things. Um, sometimes, like, for example, when I was in the first grade, I did Taekwondo for one month. That is not something that I would want to put down uh, as, as, an, as an accomplishment. Or, um, I don't know, there is uh, people that have been studying in musical school for seven years and they have actually received a specific degree. Um, there is, um, I don't know, basically commitment is the, the time that you have uh, spent doing a particular activity and the, the results that you have achieved in that particular field, in that particular activity, right? So do make sure that you actually mention those things and that those things are reflected because you can say that I got the black belt in uh, karate, um, but people might not know what it, what it actually took for you to get to that point. So do make sure that you actually share all of that. In terms of the breadth, uh, we... And this is, universities are different in that sense, right? So some universities will want for you to uh, definitely mention all of the accomplishments in that one field that you're applying for. They, they would want to see all of the accomplishments in that field. Uh, other universities like Minerva are different in that sense. We want to see the breadth of the activities that you have been doing. We want to see any uh, extracurricular activities beyond your actual interest. So, for example, you've been passionate about physics and you have the majority of your accomplishments in physics, that is completely fine. But at the same time, we would want to see what are the other things that you have been doing that make you you. Uh, and the fourth one is the depth. And depth is... Um, not the hardest thing specifically in our region, because I feel like with the sort of like with, with the mentality and with the context that we live in, we're sort of like thrive. We're, we're trying to uh, get to that particular point where we excel at something. We don't usually have extracurricular just for the fun of it. Our parents usually make us get to a specific level and actually get some specific results from that 
um, from that activity. Uh, but yeah, definitely think about that. Definitely make sure that you show how much you have grown doing that particular activity. How, uh, what is the result and uh, what is the ranking or specific level to which you have got through your commitment in that particular um, activity. And we can go to the next slide. And the next slide is uh, something that I mentioned earlier, right? So uh, I, I said that we would have uh, sort of like several cases or like several situations. And what I would want for you to do right now, even though that I cannot uh, see you or hear you, uh, I would still want for you to uh, reflect on which of those accomplishments sounds the most impressive to you. And you can see the three slide, uh, the, the three examples on this slide, right? So there's the first one uh, that says that, um, and this is actually a true story, it's about me. And uh, I did win a chemistry Olympiad in the 10th grade. The second one uh, is about someone who participated in a clothing drive for the homeless. And the third one is uh, for about someone who organized the first expert visits uh, for their school's debate club, and they have been leading that for a year. And uh, last year, they invited 30 speakers that trained 350 students in storytelling, project management, and networking from 10 different schools. And it is now a countrywide project partially uh, funded by the government. So do take a second and reflect for yourself, which one of those accomplishments sounds the most impressive to you? And I'm going to give you one second just to think about that. And again, if you had to choose, which one would you choose? Make a mental note to yourself. And we do this a lot at different um, at different sessions. And in a lot of cases, students usually to choose the third one because it has a lot of context. It has a lot of data. It has uh, sort of like the, the before and after snapshot. It has the uh, the numbers that help understand the context uh, and uh, it has the relevant details. In reality, all three of them can be really impressive and good accomplishments. Um, someone could have won uh, a chemistry Olympiad on the international level, and maybe it took for them, like it took a year for them to actually get to that point. And they've been uh, trained by, um, I don't know, they, they've been selected to be trained by the best um, teachers in the country, or they had to do like an independent project to do this or that. Um, it could have been a very different path, but because nothing is specified there, we have no idea. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, it is a true story. I actually did win a chemistry Olympiad in 10th grade, but I only won it because there were two people competing in it and it was at my uh, school level. I was actually going into a different room and um, they just stopped me and they just uh, asked me to take a part in that particular Olympiad. So this is clearly not, um, not an accomplishment that I specifically in my context, in my uh, situation should mention because it means nothing. But for someone who has been doing that on a national or an international level and they had to go through all of those different um, the different levels and the commitment that they had to do and maybe they did a specific project for that and things like that, it is essential and is, it is important to mention that context. Same goes for the second one because we don't know what participate it is. Some people, due to, again, mentality and uh, the national specifics, to, are just too shy to actually uh, claim their particular role. Or maybe the role uh, was that you did so many things, you don't know what to mention. It is important to mention every single thing that you've been doing for that particular project. It is also important to mention that um, the details with regards to how many homeless shelters did you actually help how many people were impacted by that what maybe you have been uh, I don't know um, organizing the logistics chain specifically for that particular activity and maybe you have been uh, managing um, I don't know 10 different pickup points and uh, then consolidated all of that and then you have been doing the I don't know the negotiation with the government and uh, you got that support and you got that funding and all of those other things that can all fall under the category of participated or maybe you just brought a t-shirt to one of the pickup points, right? So it's extremely important to mention what exactly you have been doing because broad words like participated or took part, they truly don't mean anything because they can mean anything. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. 
so the tip number two is the fact that numbers help with context at a huge level. Wherever you can put numbers, I am urging you to please do that. And this particular slide is extremely helpful, not just for the students that are applying to universities, but also for people who are putting on putting their CVs together as well. Uh, as a side note, I used to be a recruiter, so this is this has been my pain forever and always. But uh, it is extremely important to use numbers whenever you're talking about your achievements, uh, because we will want to see we will want to see what was the improvement in terms of the percentage. Maybe because you started volunteering at that animal shelter, the um, the workers' time uh, has been reduced by an hour, which allowed for 20 more. Um, percent uh, of the capacity to be open, which then allowed for 100 more dogs. Or we will want to see, um, for example, and this is my favorite one because students always, always forget about that. When you're talking about a competition, specifically an Olympiad, do talk about the different levels. So like the, the school level, the district level, the city level, the, um, I don't know, like the regional level, the national level and things like that. Do talk about all of those numbers. How many people participated against you in that particular level of that particular competition? This is essential to understand the context of that competition. Because guess what? In different uh, countries uh, and in different types of competitions, things are done very, very differently. Sometimes you have to go through all of those circles to actually get into that particular level. Sometimes you get nominated specifically to that national or international level in some cases. And unless you actually uh, share what the process looked like specifically for you, I mean, let's face it, universities like Minerva will still research and will still uh, get whatever information that we need. But um, no one can tell your story as well as you. So do make sure that you're always tracking that information and you're always specifying how many people participated in that. Another thing about competition that I think can be relevant for the students is the fact that, for example, you've been uh, selected to be a part of a specific research project or you started working, but it was a very competitive role to which you had to go, like you had to go through a specific selection selection to actually get there. And um, I don't know, the recruitment initially during recruitment, the organization was looking at that like a thousand people, and then they selected you out of that thousand people. That is still a competition. So do make sure that whatever sort of like you have been selected for is reflected in your application because we will want to know. We will want to see that. Uh, we talked a little bit about the role and uh, the main and sort of like the key idea is the same there. Do make sure that you uh, mention the specifics of the role, the things that you have been doing and the things that you have been in charge of. Uh, another sort of like piece of content that can be helpful here is whether this is something that has been done before whether this is a one-time thing. It's not necessarily a good or a bad thing, but it will help us understand the context a little bit better. Perhaps you've never had a debate club in your, uh, in your town ever in the history of the town. We will want to know that because it's a very different experience from, from launching a uh, debate club in, I don't know, San Francisco, right? So uh, do mention that uh, and we will want to know. And in terms of transferable knowledge, um, Again, that can be a very helpful uh, part of the context for you just to share what are the additional skills that you have learned that uh, you started using later on. Maybe you've been uh, training together with your team um, on, I don't know, like preparing for the Olympiad and uh, you have been leading that team and that team leadership you have later on transferred into the SAT prep uh, initiative that you've been running with Education USA, right? So definitely catch those different moments and mention them as part of your application. And we can go into the next slide. Uh, one more thing, when you talk about your accomplishments, um, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier as well, universities are going to be different, right? Some universities will want to see all of your achievements and accomplishments in this one particular field. You're applying to physics and they will want to see everything that you have done within physics. Some other universities, including Minerva, 
will want to see a broader, more holistic picture of who you are outside of the classroom. So we will want to make sure that um, sort of like the accomplishments that you put down really and truly reflect who you are. Pick the best ones, but make sure, and there is like, for example, in, 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 Minerva's, uh, in Minerva's accomplishment section, there are six different spaces for six different accomplishments. Um, make sure that you show this diversified picture of who you are. And accomplishments can be on a, of a different level. And for some students, for example, it just happened to be that all of their accomplishments uh, have been um, sort of like all of their best accomplishments have been in that uh, field of physics. Still, do not put all six of your accomplishments um, specifically in physics. Leave at least three for other things that may be a little bit weaker, but still show who you are outside of the classroom. For universities like Minerva, and we usually say that out loud pretty pretty clearly and pretty loudly that we want to see the diversified and the breadth of your um, activities. Um, when you see a university mention that, definitely hear what they're saying, because uh, we're not just saying that for the sake of saying it. We actually want to see the multiple diversity things that you have been doing. One more thing uh, that I see with the student applications is in the fact that uh, sometimes students don't feel like, like for example, they have five very strong accomplishments and then they don't feel like they have anything else to offer. And when you start talking to them, uh, it turns out that they actually do, but these are accomplishments that are just, as the student thinks, not as strong as the others. And that is a very crucial mistake. If you think that leaving an empty space and not writing down anything is better than uh, writing, like using all six of those spaces and actually putting something that might seem weaker to you, you're wrong. Use every single opportunity to share about who you are. Use every single space, every single chance, every single interview, every single, mm, I don't know, like additional box to share as much information about yourself as you can. Again, no one can tell the story of yourself better than you. No one can tell about your experiences better than you. Um, use this chance and uh, make sure that everything is represented to the maximum. The next one, please. Uh, and yeah, this is all uh, when it comes to the uh, the accomplishments. Uh, thank you so much for being a part of this. I would be very, very happy to answer whatever questions you might have. And I hope this, ha this has been helpful. I'm very glad to reflect a little bit more on um, sort of like the, the w whatever questions you might have. And I'm happy to reflect on your um, on your questions. Thank you, Alona. I hope you can hear me because I have a little. OK, great. Um, thank you, Alona, for the presentation and for the tips, uh, wonderful tips. And I, I'm sure that everybody um, took notes. And uh, we do have a couple of questions. First of all, there was a question about the recording. Yes, we will have the recording of this webinar and uh, you will find it on our YouTube channel so you can access it anytime when you want. And also, uh, another question was about Minerva. So, Alona, is it the school that's situated in San Francisco? Is it the one? It is. Uh, at the same time, our students don't just live in San Francisco. They actually live in seven different countries. So they end up living in San Francisco, Taipei, Seoul, Hyderabad, Berlin, Buenos Aires, and London. So that, that's the part of the program. They actually do get to live in all of those places. Wonderful. Um, and I think it, it sounds really fun <laughs> to travel uh, uh, while you study. Um, so, yes, let me see. We have a couple of questions. And thank you very much for your participation in the uh, cases that Alona actually put there in her presentation. Um, so the question, if, if I participated in a theater club for six years and was a president of the club for two years, could that be considered as an accomplishment? How do I prove it? if there is no diploma about it. So if I can add to the question, is there anything that needs to 
justify or prove the accomplishment, any kind of a document that the university might require from the students, not only just the, you know, just the words from the student. Absolutely. Uh, both very brilliant questions. Um, in terms of the evidence, absolutely. You will need to provide the evidence for any accomplishment that you mention, and that can come in different forms. That can be uh, a recommendation letter from, and this is actually a response to uh, the, 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 the theater uh, club case. I'm guessing that there is a coordinator, for example, that uh, is in charge of, uh, you know, organizing the work of the theater club. And uh, their recommendation can be a, a good addition to, uh, to that. Another, um, it can always be a certificate, it can always be a diploma, it can always be um, sort of like Sort of like any validation um, of and like the, the the provision of evidence of that particular activity is good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, there is another question: Will be um, a flex finalist great achievement for Minerva School, particularly? Well, that's a good one. Uh, <laughs> specifically in the context of Ukraine, uh, that's a really fun question because we do have so many Ukrainian flexors. You have no idea. I think the majority of people in that year uh, when we had 19 Ukrainian students, which is like that was the largest population of um, uh, any students from any country in that year, except for the United States. Um, but yeah, I mean, in terms of flex, uh, we're definitely very aware of what the program is uh, and we're always very very happy to see uh, students from that program that being said uh, if a student only did flex we will definitely want to see more we will want to see more projects more volunteering more activities so just on your flex i don't think you would be able to ride very far specifically with minerva but um when we're talking about flex in addition with a number of other uh, significant projects, absolutely. Thank you. In terms of the recommendation letters, does it have to be translated to English? We do not require a recommendation letter, so for us that's different, but yes, uh, whatever, except for the transcripts. Uh, I mean, for the transcripts we will need like an, an unofficial uh, translation, but uh, for whichever documents you're providing, um, you need to keep in mind that the people that are reviewing that, uh, those documents, the people in the admissions team will most likely speak only English. So I would definitely uh, cross check with the admissions team whether they would want to have those documents officially translated or unofficially translated. And uh, in my practice, it's always been unofficially translated. Um, but yeah, of course, we will want to uh, get the any supporting documentation, be that a recommendation letter or uh, a transcript translation or a financial aid application, specifically a financial aid application. Uh, we will definitely want to receive that in English, yes. Thank you. Well, uh, I mean, I think this is uh, this is all for my audience so far. Maybe we can wait for a couple of seconds and see if uh, there will be more questions. But uh, like as a, as a final, like probably a recommendation. So if some of the um, some of our audience is planning to apply in a year or two and they just like at the beginning of their, you know, creating their profile as a future student in the in American University, what would you recommend to boost? What would you recommend to do to create a great profile just to be considered a really competitive That's a really applicant? Question. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. And I think there are several things that one definitely needs to focus on. The first one is uh, identifying the fields and the sort of like potential future activities in which you will excel. Because uh, it's one thing to be a part of a uh, hundred different activities and um, yeah, you drew for a month, then you were singing for two months, then you were doing, uh, I don't know, like modern dance for three months and all of that. It's fun, it's great, but at the same time it doesn't actually show any commitment, it doesn't show any um, sort of like uh, achievement, uh, potential achievement that you could have had in that particular uh, field in that particular activity simply because you didn't have the time, you didn't have the failures, you didn't have the successes, and you didn't actually grow in that particular uh, field in that particular activity, right? So um, my first advice is for, for those who are still sort of like 
who still have the time, uh, is definitely uh, identify the things that you're more or less passionate about and just try to grow within them. Go through fails, go through growth, get get better in that thing, uh, achieve things, uh, like achieve certain, I don't know, ranks and um, belts and I don't know, whatever, right? Uh, so make sure that you're actually growing within that field. That is my advice number one. My advice number two is always be mindful of the activities that you're doing. And um, if possible, um, which I think is not just a university application advice, but a life advice in general, if possible, do try to make sure that the things that you're doing are meaningful and impactful. Because we can do so many things for fun, but at the same time, doing things for fun can also be contributing to the community. So if you can find the activities that uh, are just beneficial for your community, uh, you will definitely stand out as a person who has been doing that, not just for the sake of a college application in the last six months, but you've actually been passionate about, you know, like making your town, your school, your community a better, better place. And um, that is something that can also be helpful. And uh, tip number three is that it's not too, too early to start researching your universities. Um, talk to university representatives, come to uh, the the sessions that we're holding either in partnerships with Education USA or uh, any other organization or the, the events that the universities are holding themselves. Um, in quarantine, in COVID, especially in quarantine, but like even in the COVID uh, times right now, in the pandemic, we uh, as universities have been holding so many different online events that are open to everyone. Start researching the universities now. Start reaching out to people like me. Because guess what? There's people like me in the majority of universities that specifically get paid to talk to you. And uh, use that opportunity. Make sure that... Uh, I mean, you're already exposed to that. Make sure that you use those opportunities. And I feel like those three things should set you on the right track to to present a successful application later on. Wonderful tips and recommendations. Thank you, Alona. Um, okay, so a few questions about actually Minerva um, School. Uh, about the funding, uh, do you offer full funding to international students? We offer need-based financial aid. So based on your family uh, budget, we will offer a financial aid that will be right specifically for you. Uh, in terms of full, uh, the maximum financial aid will still require for you to do a specific investment. And I am not allowed to uh, say the numbers by myself because uh, this will be of a right amount. But uh, what I can say is that I'm working with Eastern Europe and Central Asia. And as you can imagine, the demand for need-based uh, financial aid is a very big question uh, in my region. Uh, and what I know is that as an institution, because we're so committed to supporting the students um, in making their dream of being a part of Minerva come true, we're supporting our students enough so that they feel comfortable and confident with uh, pursuing their education at Minerva. Uh, I know that's very vague and that is intentional because this is the guideline, but yes, students feel rather comfortable with the financial aid that they get. And again, working with Eastern Europe and Central Asia, believe me, you're not the only one thinking about financial aid. Wonderful. Uh, so another question, is it okay to have more achievements last year, for example, than, uh, than this one? I believe uh, oh, it's not good fact. I mean, I believe the question is about like achievements that you had like a year ago and this year you don't have anything in particular. Well, uh, if, if I get it right, yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it's fine. I'm not going to say that it's something, some horrible thing. We definitely would want to see a specific dynamic of you being active with what you have. But at the same time, we realize that, well, for example, first of all, because of the pandemic, a lot of things that could have been made possible did not, did not happen because of the pandemic. And um, a quick note on that, we will always review the achievements that should have happened but didn't because of the pandemic. So all of the preparation that you have been doing, all of the selection you have gone through, you can still put that as uh, as an accomplishment. So that's one thing, right? If that's pandemic related, you can still put those accomplishments. We will review them based on what you have done up to that particular point. If you think that this is a strong one. However, 
We're asking to uh, share achievements and accomplishments from the past three years, which is which basically means that we will be uh, happy to review whatever you have done with those, within those three years. And I hope that answers your question because, yeah. Well, yes, I, I believe so, uh, because this is like this is the main question now we have uh, for many students, because this year was kind of a gap for many students. So unfortunately, they couldn't have a lot of activities uh, because of the COVID. Uh, another question is about the um, application package. So would uh, school, well, uh, specifically Minerva school, would schools need to provide any documents to Minerva? Uh, like transcripts, reference letters, um, and what documents are required uh, for, 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 um, by Minerva School? So talking about us specifically, we will want the uh, transcript submission from your school counselor, right? So uh, you will have to submit the transcript and they will have to submit the transcript on their side. Uh, this is what we would need. Uh, in terms of other institutions, definitely check that on their website. Usually, that's a recommendation letter and a um, a transcript as well. Sometimes they might want to ask for something else, but again, do go into that particular website of that university. Um, why it's important? Let me just explain just a little bit of why it's important. Uh, in our countries, we're used to having a Ministry of Higher Education. That is this one government organ that controls whatever higher education does, what requirements they have, uh, which is why everything is unified in our countries. Uh, in the States, it's different. They don't have a Ministry of um, Higher Education per se. There's a Ministry of Education, but it's a different thing. So they do not have this one entity that would control every single university, every single institution, which is why every single university is autonomous and every single university has their own um, requirements and their own um, requirements, right? So check all of that on their website, specifically talking about the Minerva schools. We will want to receive your transcripts and that is it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, yes, and I invite everybody to uh, to our regular lectures uh, every last Thursday. Um, uh, education is a Ukraine, and you will learn more about the uh, educational system in the United States, why it's uh, so unique, and um, how to get prepared to, uh, for admission uh, at the American universities. Uh, do you have master's degree program uh, programs connected to creating social innovation? In, uh, uh, we have one master's program, which is a very exciting one. I'm not sure how that's connected to what you have been uh, mentioning earlier, because it's a master of science and decision analysis, right? It's a really cool program for someone who is looking to grow in their career. And it's sort of like an emerge between master of data science and an MBA program. So that's very much uh, sort of like making decisions based on big science and leadership uh, and sort of like developing leadership skills through the MBA prism, MBA lens. That is the program that we offer. Uh, if there's more questions, I would be extremely happy to talk to you. You can even reach out to me directly. Uh, and by the way, anyone can reach out to me directly. My email is super easy. It's just alona at A-L-E-N-A -E at minerva.kgi.edu. Or you can just go into the website. My uh, name is the only Russian speaking name in the contact us uh, sheet. So you can, uh, you can find me there. But yeah, we do have one master's program. It's an online program. It's not a residential program. Uh, and it has a very interesting structure. So if you have more questions, I would be very happy to share more. Thank you. Well, I think uh, we had a lot of really good questions today and um, a lot of good information. Thank you, Alona, uh, again for your time and for the uh, insight that you provided to us. Uh, and thank you for um, like great work and um, you know been great support to American uh, to Education USA Ukraine. You know we've been working together uh, for a couple of years now. So uh, really appreciate uh, um, our collaboration, let's say. And uh, for everybody, just feel free to contact Education USA and Ukraine as well if you need uh, contact information for Alona or if you um, have more uh, questions about the 
uh, admission process or um, about specifically um, about your uh, recommendation letters or motivation letters, letters of motivation. We have uh, tutorials on how to write them and we have a lot of uh, nice video on your YouTube channel on how to improve uh, your, like, to boost your profile on how to improve the admission commission. And um, so thank you and everybody uh, have a nice rest of the day and I uh, wanna uh, have a nice day to you. Um, thank and you. see you next. Mm -hmm. So see you next time. I hope this has been helpful. I hope this has been fun. At least it's been fun for me. I hope this, this has been fun for you as well. Do reach out. Uh, but yes, do make sure that you use Education USA resources because they are a gold mine. Uh, and if you have any more questions, reach out to me. So goodbye, everybody. Goodbye.